Hi, I'm Kevin, and in this video, I'm going to go over some very basic things about the Web Audio API and give some examples um, just to give you some familiarity as to what it is and what it can do. So, what is the Web Audio API? Uh, basically, it's a standard that's implemented in many, many browsers that gives you the ability to do real time audio. Um, so playing, synthesizing, and analyzing for just about any kind of application you can think of. So as you can see, browser support's really good. Um, it's pretty much supported across the board at this point, um, other than some, you know, some people who are lingering on uh, Internet Explorer, it's pretty good at this point. Uh, so it's, it's safe to use, and there's all kinds of cool stuff in there. So a little history of doing audio in the browser. Um, in the uh, good old days, we had, you know, just like Flash and Java and proprietary systems. And so, you know, everybody kind of had a very different way of approaching audio. Uh, then we finally got in HTML5 the audio tag so we could at least play back. Um, and there was a little bit of an API that came with that. Uh, around 2008, Mozilla came up with what they called the Audio Data API. That was like a really low level access to like float, 32-bit arrays, and all kinds of crazy stuff. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of performance problems and it. it really didn't catch on. And then uh, in Chrome, we had the Web Audio API that came out and theirs was really focused on the gaming community. And so, you know, it's a little bit more, um, a little bit more higher level, uh, a little bit easier to use, um, but it's pretty complete in terms of, you know, all the different uh, tools that it provides. And that's really what became the standard spec was the one that was in Chrome. And now every browser, including Firefox, has uh, included uh, the Web Audio API in it. So a couple of examples of just things that the Web Audio API can do. Um, here you can see basically an entire DAW has been written with it. So it's possible to do just about anything that you could do in a desktop application that you can think of. Um, you know, and there's also more artistic expressions that you can do as well. Um, this one's pretty cool. Um, it just has like a little bit of reverb and delay and each time a, a node lights up it um, you know plays back a, a, an oscillator so hopefully the audio from that comes through on the recording but if it doesn't you can uh, you know, just Google it and, you know, you can experience that for yourself. It's pretty simple, but also really nice at the same time. Um, so the plan for this video, I'm first going to show how to play a sample. Um, and then from that, I'm going to plug that, uh, that code basically into writing a drum machine. And then... Um, uh, I'm going to go over the um, kind of some basic things about synthesizers and then I'm going to show you how to play an oscillator, how to make a basic synthesizer, and then we're going to combine the drum machine and the synthesizer to make like a really basic, you know, looping track. So it'll be very simple, um, but enough just to kind of give you a taste of what it can do and how to work with it. So to play a sample, we're basically going to do three things. Um, we're going to make an AJAX request to get the file over the open, open internet. Um, we're going to load that file into a buffer, um, which is just basically some memory that we've set aside for that audio to sit in. And then we're going to trigger it, which will you know actually then play back the buffer. So I've got some code. Um, here on my machine, um, you know, and I've got my five different parts that we're going to do today. And I've also got my web browser open and, and ready for uh, that. So here you can see I have an audio file, just a drum machine, um, you know, that is, um, is it's just a simple drum sample that we're going to play back. So I, again, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this, but... Um, 
you know, it kind of has like a, a snare like sound. So this is pretty easy. The first thing that we need to do whenever we're working with the web audio API is we need to create a context. So that's going to be our first thing. And just for today's purposes, I'm just going to be using ES5. Um, so um, it's kind of a, a bit of an old school thing, but some browsers only support it with just like the WebKit prefix. So this is just a way of creating it regardless of what it's been named. After this point, it, it's not browser specific, so it'll just be kind of general. So we're going to make an old school XML HTTP request. Um, so this might not, hopefully isn't new to you, but if it is, um, this is kind of the underlying way that we make Ajax. This is kind of the way that's built into the browser. Um, and then we're just going to say XHR open. We're going to make a get request and then we're going to use that audio file. And then uh, we're going to do our response type as an array buffer, right? So with audio files, basically the way the computer represents them is like a really long array. And then um, each number in that array is like from 0 to 65,535. Um, and then each one of those is one forty-four thousand one hundredth of a second um, in like CD quality audio. So each number is like this like little tiny part of a um, time and it tells like what the amplitude is at that particular point in time. So that's why it's an array. Um, so and then basically when we're loading, uh, we'll need to set that up. And then at the end of all of this, we're going to um, send that request. So we're just going to say, hey, context.decode audio data. And then we're going to take the response from our Ajax request. And then we're going to, this is an asynchronous function, so it has a callback. And then uh, we're going to create a new buffer. So we've made our Ajax request. Now we're going into the buffer. Create buffer source. Now we're going to connect our buffer to the destination. So uh, basically everything in the audio API is a graph. This is really familiar for audio people, like the idea of having like a module where you plug it in with a physical cable. So that's kind of the metaphor that's going on here. So context.destination is like our output. And then we're going to say that our buffers, well, buffer is audio. Um, so that's again that decoded audio that we have and then I'm just gonna go ahead and play it so this is the actual triggering so we're gonna say start at zero that says to start at you know um, the zero entry of the array so hopefully if I've typed this all out right we'll hear a sound when I play it so yeah you can at least see here that it is playing that sound um, all right so that's basically all there is to playing a sample. Now I'm going to show you a little bit more code um, and how maybe you would approach this for like a drum machine. So I've got my drum machine file here and I've already got some code here started just so I'm not talking forever. I just kind of want to focus on uh, the audio API parts of this. So I do have this clock JS and basically uh, it's just going to you know, using that audio context, uh, it's just going to be keeping track of um, the time for us. So that's kind of an important part of anything sound related. Now, one big thing to note is that when you are working with the Web Audio API, you want to use the timers that are kind of built in with the Web Audio API and not like the date function in JavaScript. The reason for that being that it just doesn't have the level of accuracy that you need. Like you really do need the one from the web audio API for sure. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, and then another piece that I'll show you here is drum machine JS. So this is basically, it's just, um, you can see that we've got some stuff that's loading uh, files and playing them back. 
So um, all this is is uh, essentially a little bit of wrapping around our counter and you know it'll take a pattern and then it'll play it back for us. So this is the actual file and here you can see I'm making an instance of my clock and I've got a, a number of beats and a tempo so that's just how many there are per pattern. And you can see I'm just loading a bunch of sample files that I've put onto S3. And then I've got my pattern here where the X is just like when it's a, like a drum hit, if you will. So, um, so that's really all there is with that. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, so the first thing that we need to do here to load the drum sample is to make a request. So I'm actually gonna start below this comment block. Um, XML HTTP request and then it's kind of very similar to what we just did so we're just gonna go ahead and get that file uh, which we've already been you know provided with and then we're gonna set our response type to be array buffer and then when that loads Um, you know, we're going to load that into a buffer. So again, we need to decode that audio data that's coming from our response. It's an asynchronous function, so we'll need to give it a callback. And then we'll say the drum, uh, which is this in this particular case, dot audio equals audio and then we'll call done. So this is pretty much the same that we did before where we you know we're making an XML request, we're using array buffer as the response type, and then we're gonna decode that response into audio. We're gonna set it basically onto a buffer. And then uh, for playback, um, essentially we need to grab our buffer or create one And then remember, context.destination is kind of like our master out. And then we're going to set the buffers buffer to be the audio of that's been decoded. And then we're going to go ahead and play it. Now, you'll notice that I'm actually doing, I'm creating a new buffer and playing it back each time. The way the web audio API works is that you basically need to create something new each time you want to play it. Like, it, it doesn't work under the way where you, you know, create once and play multiple times. Uh, and that might be a little confusing or a little bit unexpected. Um, I know for me, when I first saw that, it was like, oh, okay. Um, but, you know, it, it's just kind of the way that this API works. You really don't need to worry about the overhead from it because everything underneath of this is native code. So, it, you know, definitely feel free to instantiate things kind of over and over again. It's not going to be like a huge performance hit. So hopefully, if I typed everything out correctly here, my drum machine will play back when um, I refresh the page. So I don't know if you can hear it in the background here, but my drum machine is definitely going right now. I'm gonna close out of that. Um, so I've got a little bit of a funky beat there. So before we move on to talking about kind of the last three um, example codes here, um, I'm going to go a little bit more into like what we're actually doing from a synthesizer perspective, just because, you know, I don't know how much you do or don't know about building synthesizers. Um, but we're going to go like at a very basic level here. So um, your five basic parameters of sound are going to be volume, which is how like loud or how soft a sound is pitch, which is how high or how low a sound is, duration, which is how long the sound is, and when duration's in a pattern, we call that rhythm. Uh, there's the color of the sound, which is like 
uh, basically what makes a clarinet different from a flute, right? Like, so what makes it have a different flavor of sound. And then the last parameter is space, so which is like where we perceive the sound to be in space. And so our, our basic uh, synthesizer here is going to include all five of these characteristics. So here's kind of an outline, and I'm going to break it down and talk about each of these parts separately. So the first thing with any synthesizer is there's going to be some kind of input. And that input is basically going to say what pitches to play, and it's going to say, um, you know, how long, like, like the timing of it. So those are kind of the two things that we're always going to have. So that pitch information is going to go into, um, in this case, our two oscillators. So we're making a two oscillator synth. And then the duration information is what we're going to, is going to go into what we call an ADSR envelope. Again, I'm going to break down each of these. So, um, you know, don't get too hung up on the, the terminology yet. Those two things are both going to go into one level of gain. So those ADSRs are going to shape the, the volume of the notes over time so that they sound like notes. And there's going to be two gains after that. Um, and those are basically like volume controls. So we can say like if we want more of one instead of two, that sort of thing. All that's going to go into a filter. And then so that's going to shape the color of the sound a little bit. And then that's going to go into pan, which is going to be our space. And then finally, again, which gives us the ability to control the overall volume of that synthesizer. So you'll definitely notice that there's a lot of gain notes. That's very, very common with a synthesizer. So there's basically four different types of oscillators. There's sine, square, triangle, and sawtooth. Uh, sine is the simplest one. It's every other sound can actually be made from sine waves. Um, the only thing with sine is that it's not the most pleasant thing to listen to just because it's such a static sound that it's uncomfortable. We like it when things change over time. We don't really like it when things are static. Uh, there's a square wave, um, which has kind of almost like a clarinet kind of sound. Um, there's triangle, which definitely kind of sounds like a, a more gentle square wave. And then there's sawtooth that has kind of a distinctive, harsh sound. But sawtooth is really good with filtering because you can really shape it and get some interesting colors. So if you aren't familiar with what those four things sound like, I definitely, you know, would just go and, and look on uh, Wikipedia or something and, and listen to some examples of those. Uh, gain is basically just like a volume control, right? So you can turn the volume up and down. That's really all a gain is. So this is ADSR, which is our envelope. So the idea is that we're going to want to change the volume over time to kind of match how natural instruments go. So the first phase is attack, where the amplitude or like the volume goes from zero to the maximum. Then during the decay phase, it goes from the maximum down a little bit to our sustain. And our sustain is um, just essentially where we're going to hold that note. And then when we release, right, that amplitude is going to then return back down to zero. You'll notice that uh, the attack, decay, and release, all of those things are in time. And then the sustain is in a relative amplitude. So that one's a little bit different because, you know, when you're playing a keyboard, for example, you don't necessarily know how long you're going to sustain the note in advance. Um, so it's actually the relative amplitude and not the time. So filtering is one of the most common things that you see pretty much across the board in audio. Uh, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to kind of turn down or remove some frequency information from our sound. So low pass is uh, pretty common where we've basically removed the high frequencies. High pass, we've removed the low frequencies. Band pass. Everything outside of the range has been removed. And then band reject, everything within the range has been removed. Um, so yeah, so basically, again, with frequencies and with filtering, we're always like reducing or uh, completely eliminating some of the, the spectrum. So that's what's always happening with filtering. 
So space is kind of fun. Um, typically, you would think of like a left right kind of panning, which the web audio API can certainly do. But it can do more than that. It can actually do um, a little bit more richer spatialization, which we're going to see. So um, essentially in a three dimensional realm, if you will, right, every sound source is going to have essentially an X, Y and Z. Um, and then azimuth, which is kind of like uh, left to right turning and then elevation is like up and down turning. Um, so we won't necessarily get into this too much, but you just have to know that the web audio API has some really rich spatialization capabilities. It has a lot to do with its history with gaming, uh, but it can be really used for just about any application. Uh, so again, just to go over this, uh, we're going to have our input that's going to go into two oscillator nodes and an ADSR envelope. Those things are going to combine on a gain so that we can shape those notes, uh, give them kind of a natural shape. We'll have two gains below that to kind of mix oscillator one and two. We're going to have a filter after that, which is going to help kind of remove some of the more unpleasant parts of the sound. Uh, we'll have some panning, which will help kind of set the sounds in different places in space. You don't want all of your sounds coming from the same place. That's kind of boring. So, you know, we spread them out. And then finally, each track is going to have its own gain node just so that we can mix it against, you know, the other instruments that we have. So, all right, let's get back into actually writing. The first thing that we're going to do is write an oscillator. So um, again, we have to start out by creating an audio context. And then um, we're going to create an oscillator from that. And then we have to give our oscillator a type. For this case, I'm going to use triangle just because it's a little bit more gentle. Um, <laughs> sorry if you can hear the dog in the background. So, and then we're going to set the frequency. Um, here, I'm just going to set it to like 400. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, again, we're just going to try to play something back briefly. And then we're going to create a gain node. And then I'm going to set that gain node's value to 0 0.1. The reason is, is that oscillators are particularly loud. So we don't want them to be at like full volume. And then we're going to hook up our oscillator to our gain node. So remember, it's kind of like we have modules and we're, we're connecting wires between them. And then we're going to connect our gain node to our output. Um, and I know it can be kind of hard to see these connections, um, you know, just sort of like through code. Uh, I believe Firefox has some really nice tooling where you can actually see the different nodes that you've connected and like, you know, how the wiring works and everything. So it's got some really nice um, developer tools built in there. And then we're going to set our current time. So again, we're going to use the timer that comes with the audio API. Uh, we're going to say start and then as of that current time, and then we're going to stop it at one second. So then, um, so we've got the, the current time from the audio. We are going to start right now and then we're going to stop in one second. So with the web audio API, everything's measured in seconds, but they are floating point numbers and they do get very specific. Um, so hopefully if that worked, I'm going to go over to my Chrome and then we'll hear that oscillator. Well, it didn't stop, but um, <laughs> I must have mistyped something. Um, Oh, oscillator.stop would have helped. Um, so yeah, you can see if you don't tell it to stop, it doesn't. Um, 
So yeah, so that's all there really is to playing an oscillator. Now again, a big note here, we're going to create an oscillator each time we play a note. So just keep that in mind that it's not like, you know, um, it, there's not really an overhead with that. So you can just make as many as you need to. All right, so I'm going to walk now through our synthesizer here just a little bit. Um, we have kind of, I've, I've already written out some code for ADSR. So again, uh, attack, decay, and release are in time. And then sustain is in relative amplitude. Um, I've given it a connect function and disconnect just to match like the web audio API. So typically when I'm writing some code um, that's kind of working on top of an API, I kind of like the syntax to be uh, match that API. And then here we can see we've got some calls that are happening in the web API, which is like cancel scheduled value, set value at time, linear ramp to value at time, right? So this is ramping up to our attack, ramp, set value at time at attack to the top, ramp back down to where the sustain is going to be over, you know, the decay time, and then set the value uh, to hold it at that sustain until the release, and then ramp down at the end back to zero. So again, this is pretty much exactly what we've described um, with an ADSR. Um, the function names are kind of long, but that just kind of comes with the territory sometimes. The other thing that um, I should probably show you is the synth player. Again, this is, you know, there's nothing too exciting here. It's gonna create a synthesizer, hook it up to our clock for us, and and play the notes uh, on a particular pattern. Uh, I'm gonna be de kind of describing things here in like some MIDI, you know, text, but it doesn't really, you know, that's not really the purpose of this. Um, and then uh, you can see down here, like we're gonna create the clock, we're gonna create that synth player, and then it's gonna play, you know, a couple of different, um, you know, patterns basically. Like, so each one of these is like a measure and those are just different notes that are being held. And um, you can see our, our we've got our, our two oscillator nodes, our gain, our filter, our pans. So we've got kind of those nodes that sort of long live. Um, we've got some basic configuration, which we'll override and some other examples. And then, um, you know, we're kind of hooking everything up here. So those oscillators hook up to the filter, well, the gain from those oscillators hook up to the filters, the filter to the pan, the pan to the gain, the gain to the output. So that kind of matches if you need to review that slide that I had previously. Anyways, all right, so I'm gonna actually show the part where we're playing a note. So again, each time we play a note, we're gonna create a new oscillator node. That's just kind of the way this API works. Um, and there's really not a lot of overhead. So there's no point in, in getting too worked up about that. All right, so we're just gonna create our two nodes and then we're gonna create, um, you know, um, our ADSR. So ADSR, this dot dynamic config. And this is just something that um, has been created here. Um, so we already have one. Um, and that just kind of sets some different parameters for the, for the synthesizer. Um, let's see. Oh, right. So I was gonna actually instead here, create our two gains. <laughs> it's been a while since I've done this one. So uh, ADSR2 gain is context create gain, right? So that's how you create a gain node. It's just create gain. We have our ADSR. And then let's see, step three, we're going to set, uh, we're going to configure our uh, oscillators here a little bit. So we're going to set os1 to frequency value equals the frequency that's come in. So again, that's one of my arguments that I have. Uh, oscillator 1's type is going to be a square. So that's just one of the basic oscillators that comes out of the box. Uh, 
uh, I'm going to set both of them to the same frequency. Sometimes it can be interesting to offset one of your oscillators just a little bit. Uh, it can add some color, but I'm not going to do that for today, but it's just something that you can play with. Um, so Sawtooth, um, again, Sawtooth is a really like kind of powerful um, uh, color. So it really makes a big difference. And then there's a detune parameter, which yes, is very uh, similar to frequency. Um, it's a little bit more musical for someone who has that background, but basically it's gonna change our frequency just a little bit. And that's gonna add some extra color just because there's a little bit of conflict between our two waves. And then we're gonna hook up our oscillators to the gain nodes. And then our second oscillator is going to hook up to our second gain node. And then our ADSR, we're going to connect those as well to those gain nodes just so that they can shape those over time. And then we're going to connect the ADSR um, gains. ADS, ADSR one gain connect that to the oscillator one gain, two gain, connect that to the oscillator two gain. So yeah, a big part of using this API is connecting nodes to each other. That's like probably the most common thing that you do. Um, and then we're gonna actually play our note. Um, so our ADSR already has the shape, but we also have to tell our oscillators when to play. Um, so we have to set, say, hey, start playing now, and then we're gonna stop it at now plus duration. So hopefully, if I've typed everything correctly here, we'll have a little ditty here. So I don't know if you can hear it from here, but it is playing, so that actually did work. The last thing I'm gonna do here um, for this presentation really is, uh, let's see what page am I on, there we go, um, is we're gonna kinda combine two and four together to make like a, a full beat. So we need to add our drum uh, class here so I'm gonna go ahead and take that and pop that in. I'm gonna take our synthesizer class that we wrote here and put that in over here. And then you'll see that I'm actually, I've got this like synth bank thing and all this does is create a bunch of different synthesizers for me so that I have multiple instruments. And you can see I've got some config and just some different patterns for each of those oscillators. Um, so hopefully if everything is put together here, we'll have a little track. Um, so it's pretty basic sounding. So it definitely has kind of an old school uh, sound. Um, the reason for that is that these are, this is very simple, like playing back, you know, basic oscillators and stuff like that. Like it's just not the most interesting thing. Um, so there's a couple of things that you can do to make this sound more interesting. So adding effects is definitely a big thing. Uh, delay is, you know, awesome. It kind of sounds like an echo. Uh, you can do all kinds of cool things with delay. Uh, there's reverberation. So what's built into the web audio API, they have an actual convolution reverberation. Uh, the way that works is they kind of like record a sound in like a physical space, like a noise in a physical space. And they apply those characteristics to whatever, you know, input 
input sound you have and so it sounds like that sound has actually been put in that space it's a really really cool uh pattern that actually is pretty you know comparatively speaking cheap on the cpu so uh, you can get some really great results um, from that reverb that's built into the web audio api uh, there's also distortion and compression so you can definitely play around with all of these different effects uh, to make it more interesting um, one of the most important things with working with synthesizers in particular is just having continuous change. So with each of these, not just like the actual node, like connecting like an oscillator to a gain or what have you, but each of the parameters can also be changed over time. So like you could have your frequency oscillating, you could have your amplitude oscillating, you can have your filter cutoff oscillating. Um, every single thing can be changed over time and when you do it makes it sound a lot more interesting and you can get a lot more like richer colors out of uh, what you're making from that there's an entire part of the web audio API devoted to sound analysis that I didn't really touch today um, it's really cool if you wanted to do like visualization or something like that uh, there's also MIDI, so MIDI is completely built in now uh, to all the implementations. If you wanted to hook up a, like a like a MIDI keyboard or a MIDI device to your uh, computer, you could actually, you know, through the web browser, uh, create an interesting experience with that. Uh, but I think the coolest thing about the Web Audio API and the thing that makes it the most interesting is the fact that you can combine it with everything else that's in the browser. You know, here you've seen XML HTTP requests, so making Ajax requests, but you can combine it with everything like WebRTC. There's all kinds of video stuff. There's WebGL, um, you know, all the form stuff. So there's all kinds of cool things that you can do with it because it's in the context of a browser, right? And you can share it out and then millions and millions of people can all experience it. And so, you know, even though it's maybe not, you know, the absolute most powerful audio API ever built. It has so much potential for reach and combining it with other technology to make it really interesting. If you want to learn more, um, I would definitely go to the MDN, which is like Mozilla's developer docs. Um, they're really great. They're accessible. Um, you know, just just the, the, to me, that's the easiest way to kind of get more in depth on how each of these individual pieces work. So I definitely recommend checking that out. And thank you. Uh, I hope this has been, uh, you know, enlightening and a good use of your time. Uh, and definitely let me know what you think. Thanks.